Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome to Prep Medic. This week's video, we are taking a look at one of the most important yet least used vital signs, capnography. This video is sponsored by Live the Creed. Live the Creed makes a lot of affordable and high quality everyday carry items from wallets, which I actually have their wallet on me right here, to medical kits from the Get Home Alive kit to IFAX, you name it, they have something for everybody, really high quality medical products. So if you're interested in pick, picking something up, I have a link down below along with my code that can save you a couple bucks. Jumping into it, end tidal CO2 is the measurement of exhaled carbon dioxide. Now, for those of you that don't know, just a quick physiology lesson. When we breathe in, we take an oxygen, our lungs exchange that in our capillaries for carbon dioxide and we breathe carbon dioxide out. At the cellular level, the same thing's happening just in reverse. The, the cells are taking in oxygen and they're expelling carbon dioxide where your circulatory system brings it back to the lungs and you exhale it. And that is where we measure end tidal carbon, carbon dioxide, so end tidal CO2. Now, there are a couple different ways we measure end tidal CO2. Right here, I have the EMMA device. So this is a really simple machine. Uh, it goes on top of an uh, endotracheal tube or a bag valve mask, you name it, and it will help us measure that right at the source. This is an inline capnography uh, uh, device. Now you have capnography, which is the graph. So you'll see there's a graph that actually comes up here, and then you have capnometry, which is the quantitative number that pops up on the screen. You also have uh, bigger machines. So on the helicopter or any ground ambulance, we carry a cardiac monitor that has a screw in that can give us the reading right on the screen of the monitor. We'll kind of show you one of those screens as we go on with the video. So traditionally, uh, end tidal CO2 was taught to paramedics as a way of verifying endotracheal tube placement. So when we put a breathing tube down somebody's throat, obviously we need to make sure it's in the right place. And one way to do that is to see if there's any kind of respiration there. So in this case, it would be end tidal CO2. We, if we have a rhythmic pattern of end tidal CO2 in our breathing for the patient, we know something is exchanging those gases and this tube is in uh, the right place. Now that's the really like simple use for it. And this is really the gold standard for any intubated patient. If you're in an EMS service that's intubating patients and you're not using end tidal CO2, uh, something's wrong. Like you, you should fix that because this is the gold standard for confirming tube placements. That's really the traditional usage of this device, but it really goes beyond that. So end tidal CO2 is a great indicator of perfusion in a variety of different uh, shock states and cardiac arrest. It's an excellent indicator for bronchoconstriction, and it can also give us an insight into the patient's underlying acid-base status. So let's go through that one by one, starting at the beginning. So the normal range for end tidal CO2 is anywhere between 35 and 45. I'm going to take a couple of these concepts and kind of condense them down, not dumb them down, but oversimplify them for the sake of this video. Obviously, this goes a little bit more in depth, but you can think of CO2 as an acid. It, it's a buffering acid in your body, so we use that to help control our acid-base balance. Now, if you have any end tidal reading above 45, we're going to call that a respiratory acidosis. If you have any reading below that 35, we're going to say it's a respiratory alkalosis, but that doesn't tell us what our metabolic status is. So it's not going to tell us metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. It can help differentiate those when we do have an ABG later on. When we look at a graph or a cardiac monitor, now there is a lot going on on this screen. Don't panic yet. We're only looking at one line of it. When we look down here at this last one, this is going to be our capnograph. So you can see the graph moving across the screen. Now, how I like thinking about uh, end tidal readouts is that the patient is sitting below looking up at the line and then they are blowing upwards. And every time they blow upwards, they balloon the line up. So when you see the graph come up in the square pattern, that is them exhaling. Now, this is the start of exhalation. This is a lot of the dead space uh, getting pushed past. So everything that wasn't actually being perfused 
uh, in your trachea. And then as we come up here, this is the actual exhalation. And your end tidal CO2, so this number here, it says 33, so that's respiratory alkalosis. That number is being pulled from the very top of that graph. So it's the maximum amount of uh, CO2 that you're exhaling in that breath cycle. When it drops back down to baseline, this is actually um, going to be your inhalation. So obviously there's no uh, CO2 going past the sensor. It's not going to pick it up. So that's why we get this graph pattern coming across there. We'll talk a little bit more about waveforms as we go onto the video. So like I said, this number here, if you intubate somebody and you have any kind of graph, that means we're in the right place with the endotracheal tube. Let's talk cardiac arrest though. So if we have this and we are doing respirations for a patient, this can actually sit right on a BVM. So we can do this with a BVM. We can attach this to an endotracheal tube if we have that. We can even uh, put this on a supraglottic airway like an eye gel. Now, while you're doing compressions, if you have a reading below 10, that means they're not perfusing. So when we have a really low uh, capnography reading, that means that there's no cellular metabolism or there's something actually restricting the exhalation of uh, CO2 from the lungs. In this case, it is most likely, oh, and then we just went back on that. In this case, it is most likely going to be uh, that compressions aren't being done well. You're not circulating blood throughout the body. It could also mean that the patient has been dead for a long period of time and they're belong, be, beyond help. However, in these cases, if you see an end tidal under 10, you should try to fix compressions, go maybe a little bit deeper, faster, make sure they're adequate for what the patient needs. As we're doing CPR, if you see a gigantic spike in that number, so you're at like you know 12, 15, which is where it will be a lot of times with good CPR, and you see it spike into the normal range, that is a good indicator that the patient just regained a pulse. So your cardiac output has gone from uh, minimal to a lot more because now it's beating on its, on its own and it's trying to wash out all this CO2 that's built up in the body while compressions were ongoing. So you'll see that spike and that's a really good indicator that they have a pulse back. So now let's touch on what end tidal CO2 can tell us about patients in a shock state. So shock states are very loosely and unofficially defined as hypoperfusion to end organs. This is a great indicator of your actual organ perfusion because if you don't have a good end tidal CO2, you might still have uh, really good O2 saturations, but if you have a bad end tidal CO2, that means that those cells aren't actually passing uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide back and forth. It means they're not being oxygenated adequately. So if you see a really low number on here and the patient is breathing at a normal rate, this can be an indicator of severe shock. I actually like using this a lot more uh, than pulse ox for these patients because pulse ox can be a little bit misleading. The other thing it can tell us is if the patient stops breathing. So we have nasal cannulas you can put on somebody that measures end tidal CO2. And if they stop breathing, if they go apneic, this will tell me right away where a pulse ox is going to take maybe five, 10 minutes before you see that starting to drop off and it's an indicator they're not breathing. So this is a great device for that. I remember in paramedic school, uh, they really told us when we were bagging a patient, so doing bag valve mask respirations for somebody, they would say, hey, if their end tidal CO2 is above 45, we need to breathe faster for them. We need to uh, blow off some of that CO2. And if uh, transversely, if that is below 35, we need to breathe slower for that patient. Or I've always worked in college towns for EMS. Uh, if you have a college age person uh, breathing really fast, having a panic attack, that would what we'd try to target. We'd have them slow down their breathing and try to bring this number back up. Now in a healthy, well-perfused individual, that is accurate advice. However, a lot of different things go into creating that end tidal CO2 number, and that's not always what we should do. A great example of that is your patients in diabetic ketoacidosis. So these patients will oftentimes have uh, Kuzmal respiration, so they'll be breathing really fast and deep. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to buffer the metabolic acidosis that is in their system. They do that by lowering their end tidal CO2 or their PA CO2, but we're only reading it this way. Now, if we were to take that patient, we were to paralyze them, intubate them, and control the respiratory rate, and we would bring that 
end title back up into the 35 to 45 range, we'd actually end up killing that patient because they're trying to buffer that acidosis. And by letting that come back to normal, we would actually cause that acidosis to get a lot worse and metabolic conditions are just going to snowball from there. So we really need to look at this in all its aspects. This is one tool for us, but it can't tell us everything about that patient and saying 35 to 45 is normal is great for a healthy individual, but we're not applying this to healthy individuals. And we have to be aware that what this is showing us doesn't necessarily mean we have to correct it right back to normal. In those diabetic ketoacidosis patients, what we will do most of the time for them is we will breathe at whatever rate we intubated them at, we're going to continue breathing at that rate, if not a little bit faster. Obviously, we would much rather not intubate them if we can help it. So let's talk really quick about what the waveform means. Uh, and I'll throw up some graphics on the screen as well as having this uh, illustration because the actual graph can tell you just as much as the number, if not more. So one of the most common things we talk about is when you see a shark fin pattern on your end tidal CO2. If you see a shark fin pattern there, that's going to be an indication of air trapping. So usually that's uh, bronchospastic lung uh, from your asthma attack uh, is kind of the, the schoolyard example that they give. So instead of it being a nice square waveform there, you'll see it slope up just like you see in the movie movie jaws and drop right off. And that's a sign that that patient needs some albuterol, something to open their lungs up so they're not air trapping quite as much. The other thing you might see in an intubated sedated patient, and this is really valid for like your ICU nurses, critical care transport, anybody that's doing RSI, is if you see, I believe it's called a curare cleft. So that's a little notch at the top of this. That means that the patient is actually trying to uh, overbreathe that vent or they're asynchronous with the vent and they're trying to breathe at a different rate than when the ventilator is actually giving them the breath. So with that, uh, just know that that patient probably needs a little bit more sedation or a different setting on the ventilator to help with their comfort. As a quick summary, guys, end tidal CO2 is the measurement of your exhaled CO2. The device itself, so a uh, capnometry device, can be used for patients that are receiving bag valve mask respirations, a patient that's intubated or on a supraglottic airway. It can also be applied in a nasal cannula where you can get really passive readings for somebody that's completely uh, conscious, alert, and breathing. It tells us a variety of different things. Number one, it's the gold standard for confirming uh, endotracheal tube placement, but it will also tell us a lot about their breathing status. So one, it tells us how fast they're breathing. It will show us instantly if the patient stops breathing or goes apneic. It will also tell us a lot of metabolic processes going on. So in CPR, uh, you might not have anything above 10. And if the patient doesn't have an end tidal CO2 above 10, their chance of survival is almost zero. But if you can fix your compressions, do better compressions, get that above 10, they have a much higher chance of being successfully resuscitated in the field. It's a really good indicator for successful resuscitation when you see that jump from that 10, 15 range up into 30s and above that they have actually regained a pulse. Lastly, it's a really good indicator in shock states and it can tell us a little bit about their metabolic state uh, status. Now, these machines here are not super accessible to the civilian population. You can get a color metric device for tube confirmation, but this device right here costs about $1,400 and then anything that's going to connect to a cardiac monitor uh, just prices most of us out at that fifteen dollars to $25,000 range. However, this is something that's really good to know for uh, responders and lay people alike, and it's a really good tool to carry. If you're in EMS and your service is not carrying something that can measure and title CO2, even EMT basic services, or sorry, EMT services, I would highly recommend you get one. I hope this wasn't too confusing. I blew through that pretty fast, but if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below, and I will see you next week.